Okay, so now we, we shift gears to looking at the people who were involved in the pre-planning, the ideation of this uh, atrocity, and the, and the deception that's been imposed on us about this. I call it a crime in progress, or an ongoing crime, because the crime happened on September 11th, 2001, but ever since then, there's been a criminal deception, a criminal cover-up of what happened that day. And that cover-up has been, you know, foisted upon us, or, or done, by the U.S. government and the media. So for 13 years, we've been living in this uh, artificial reality where, where their lies fly, and we've been, and we've been given a, a, just a pack of lies. But those pack of lies are very dangerous because they have taken us to war on those lies. Now, here are the three characters that came to power in Israel in the late 70s. The guy in the middle with the glasses is Menachem Begin, and, and Yitzhak Shamir over there on the far side, and here is, uh, is uh, Ariel Sharon. These men are bona fide de facto terrorists and have been terrorists their whole adult lives. Um, the, they, what they did in 1975, they, they created a, a coalition party called the Likud Coalition, which is the coalition that runs Israel today. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu is part of that coalition, and that coalition was comprised of the former heads of the terrorist gangs that, that plagued Palestine in the 30s and 40s, the Irgun and the Lehi Gang, or the Stern Gang. Yitzhak Shamir was head of the Stern Gang, and Menachem Begin was the head of the Irgun. This is, this is a photograph of, of Begin's handiwork when he blew up the King David Hotel. This is the um, Volker Bernadotte, the Swedish mediator who was sent to Palestine to try to make a, uh, some arrangement whereby the partition plan of 1947 could put, be put into effect. He was killed, he was, he was murdered by um, Yitzhak Shamir's gang. As you can see there, the Stern group is blamed. He was killed Bonnie and Clyde style in Jerusalem. He happened to be, he's also the, the, the king of Sweden's uncle. Um, and this is the, the handiwork of Ariel Sharon, the third man in that photograph. This is, the, this is just the one picture of the Sabra and Shatila massacre in September 1982, when Israeli troops had secured these camps of Palestinian refugees and then sent in the Falange, the Christian Falange, who killed all these people for three days running with the knives. And uh, thousands of people were killed. And as a result of this, 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 this atrocity led to the largest protest in Israeli history against the man who was blamed for it. The man who was blamed for it was, of course, the Minister of Defense at the time, Ariel Sharon. And he lost the, the, the Kahan Commission. It was commissioned in Israel to find out who was responsible. The Kahan Commission found Ariel Sharon personally responsible for the massacre. He, was his, he, he lost his portfolio as Minister of Defense. And they made the recommendation that he never serve in Israeli, in Israeli government again. In the year 2001, he became Prime Minister which should have been a big red flag for the whole world because this man was a known genocidaire. He's been committing atrocities like this since he was like 19 years old. His deputy was this fella, Ehud Olmert, who I discovered was in New York City on 9-11. One of their cronies is this man, um, Benjamin Netanyahu, whose father was basically the director of revisionist Zionism, the NZO, um, in New York in the 40s. This is why this uh, Bibi Netanyahu speaks English with an uh, American accent because he, he went to school in America. Here he is with his father. And this man, Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu, will be coming to the United States this week. I think he's probably already here. Uh, he'll be speaking in front of Congress and it's been a big to-do about that. Um, as I said, his father was the executive director of the New Zionist organization after Vladimir Jabotinsky died in New York in the 40s. Now, to make it understandable, this wing of Zionism is the most radical, most extreme, most violent, most ruthless terrorist part of Zionism. And he's the head of it. Um, his, his mentor, Jabotinsky, had written, an article, had written a book, an essay in 1923, calling for the construction of an iron wall between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Here's Netanyahu in the Grand Synagogue in Paris about a month ago, waving like he's the savior of the Jewish people. And after this, atroc after this, this shooting in, in um, Paris, he told the French Jews that you should come home to Israel now. You cannot live in France any longer. And this is the same thing he repeated after the Danish attacks. So you have to see, what is the takeaway, what is like the takeaway from these, these, these crimes? 
The takeaway, what you're supposed to get out of it, is that Jews are not safe in Denmark or France. You should go to Israel. So that's, that's kind of like the attitude change that the masters of these crimes wanted to get across. Now here's Netanyahu with his former commander, um, Ehud Barak. Ehud Barak was former prime minister, secretary of defense, chief of staff. He was also the commander of a covert commando force called the Sayeret Matkal. And when he was the commander of that Sayeret Matkal, a co covert commando force serving under the uh, minister of defense, or the, the chief of defense, Netanyahu was his soldier. So the relationship of these men is commander to soldier. Ehud Barak, when he was minister of defense in 2008-2009, committed this, uh, this kind of atrocity where he launched uh, missiles of white phosphorus on the civilian population of Palestine, of Gaza. And here's a school, a school, the United Nations school in Gaza, um, on the receiving end of white phosphorus. And white phosphorus is, of course, a banned weapon because if it strikes you, if it lands on you, it will just burn through your whole body. You can't stop it. So if it lands on your skin, it'll, it'll go through the bone and come out the other side. It's hideous. Hideous and banned weapon. It's terrorism. Now, what's interesting about in the 9-11 is that uh, when 9-11 happened, this man, Ehud Barak, was in the studio of BBC World in London giving his analysis of what happened before the towers even fell. And what he said is that the world will never be the same from this day on. He said, we know who's behind this. It's Osama bin Laden. And we know where Osama bin Laden is. He said, now is the time for America to begin an operational war on terror. And that was basically, in a nutshell, what then became the official version for 9-11. And as you know, we went to war in Afghanistan three weeks later. And here, this I call this the Troika of Terror. Um, some people look at this and say, oh, those are Israeli leaders. No, they're terrorists. Um, the first guy here, Shimon Peres, is, was pre president of Israel when this photo was taken. Um, he has been involved in bringing illegal weapons to Israel since 1948. And he's also the mastermind of Israel's illegal nuclear arsenal. So you see, um, maybe an, a Zionist apologist will say, oh, well, that's a good thing. But other people will say that these are terrorists who have their hands on a nuclear arsenal. So you're talking about if there's one place in the world where, a nuclear, where, where nuclear weapons are in the hands of terrorists, look to Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. This is the former head of the Mossad, Isar Harel. And that's the logo of the Mossad, which says, by deception, we shall, you shall do war. And in 1979, Isar Harel told an American um, visitor, missionary, or evangel evangelist, that terrorism would come to the United States and Arabs would attack the tallest buildings in New York City. He said that in 1979. And 22 years later, it came true. So he's either amazingly prescient or he's exposing the, the true source of the terrorism. Here he is in a photograph from earlier. Here he is later in life. And this is the man he told it to, Michael Evans of Texas, who is a, a Jewish man who's a Christian evangelist and a big supporter of the right-wing Zionist cause. Here he is in 1979 visiting the Netanyahu's. Now this is the man, the man on the left is Michael Evans, and he is the one who said after 9-11 that in 1979, the former head of Mossad had told him that prediction. And he was pretty well connected. Here he is meeting with Menachem Begin, when Begin was the prime minister. And here he is in 2012 giving a speech in Israel. You can see down here is Glenn Beck and David Barton. These people are what you call Christian Zionists. These are the people who, who try to, um, through television audiences, try to inculcate among Christians that, they, that their obligation is to support the state of Israel. This fellow here is the main Mossad agent in Hollywood. His name is Arnon Milchan, and he produced movies like JFK and Brazil. Here he is with two of his uh, properties, two of the people who work for him. And here he is with the people that he, he uh, reports to. He's very close to, he calls, he calls Shimon Peres his best friend, because Shimon Peres created a secret organization, a, cre a secret cabal called Lekem, and Lekem was tasked to obtain in the United States the components for a nuclear arsenal. And they put him in charge, Arnon Milchan. And Arnon Milchan, his very first movie he made was of a plane flying into the Pan Am building. This is in 1978. The film is called The Medusa Touch. Richard Burton was in it. 
And the climactic scene of the movie is this, where 747 flies into the uh, Pan Am building. This is the cover of the book. Um, Peter Van, Van Greenway is not Dutch. It's a nom de, nom de plume. He's a Jewish guy. The publisher is a Jewish company. And obviously, Arnon Milchan, who produced the movie, is an Israeli. So this idea of planes flying into buildings was all on the mind of Arnon Milchan. In the year 2000, he made this television show with Rupert Murdoch. It's a spin-off of the X-Files. It's called The Lone Gunman. And in the pilot episode, a 757 or 767 is remotely hijacked. The pilots are flying the plane, but unbeknownst to them, the plane has been remotely hijacked and is being flown into the World Trade Center. At the very last minute, they, they are able to get control back and pull the plane up, and it just, just narrowly misses the World Trade Center. <clears throat> this is exactly the kind of thing that happened to the Malaysia Flight 370. That plane was on its way to Peking, but somebody, you know, over Malaysia, turned the, the waypoints, and the plane took a left turn, 90 degrees, and went out over the ocean there. So, and, and why we can see that something happened like that is because the co-pilot tried to make a cell phone call when the plane was passing over Penang. Now, why would the pilot be trying to make, use a cell phone to, to make a call? Because all the communication devices had been cut. So the plane was hijacked, communication was cut off, and dropped in the ocean someplace. Here is uh, one of the head Mossad agents who, who got the contract for the World Trade Center in the 1980s. His name is Zvi Malkin, and he supposedly quit the Mossad as an agent in 1949, in, when, no, when he was 49 years old, excuse me, and he had kidnapped Eichmann and done other things. He was involved, I think, in the plutonium smuggling. And supposedly, at age 49, he decided to retire to New York and become a painter or dabble in artwork. When he got the contract for the World Trade Center security for a company called Atwell Security of Tel Aviv, he did it with this man, another Mossad agent. But when the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey discovered that this man was a convicted murderer, they tore up the contract. Had they not torn up the contract, the 9-11 would have happened about 10 years earlier. And the head of that organization, with the, which those men were also part of, um, of getting nuclear pl plutonium, getting the nuclear devices, and, and all the components for making nuclear bombs, um, the head man was this man with the glasses. His name is Rafi Eitan. He's also the spy master who ran Jonathan J. Pollard. And here he is drinking with Avi Ramnir. Avi Ramnir was the Israeli manager of the Iran-Contra scandal from the 80s, if you remember that. This is, this is, this is the, the, the Iran-Contra scandal and the drugs and weapons for, weapons for drugs and all that kind of thing. This is the crime where the Bushes and the Clintons and the Israelis are all tied together. And this is the man who owned Atwell Security of Tel Aviv when those guys got the contract for the World Trade Center before it was torn up. And his name is Shaul Eisenberg. He's basically Mossad's Mr. Big in Asia. Uh, this, when, they, when, they, when the Mossad, when these Israelis were unable to get the security contract directly with Atwell Security, they didn't give up. Instead, they decided to work through American Jews that had high positions. And they, they used Jules Kroll, this man, who um, had a company called Kroll Associates. And after the first bombing in the World Trade Center in 1993, his company got the security contract for the World Trade Center. They revamped the whole security procedure, and they, re they, they remained in charge of security at the World Trade Center through, through the destruction of the towers. And, and Jules Kroll's partner was this man, Maurice Greenberg, former head of CAIG. And AIG was the company that received the $180 billion bailout during the, uh, uh, the billion-dollar bailout, we call it, trillion-dollar bailout. And, and Maurice Greenberg, this man, and Jules, Jules Kroll um, were co-owners of all the companies that were involved. Now, what's interesting is here is that the very first plane that struck the North Tower, the, plane that the first plane struck the computer room of MMC, that stands for Marsh McLennan, which was a company that was headed by his son. And another, another member of this uh, Kroll Associates is this man, Jerome Hauer, uh, former employee of Kroll and director of the New York City Office of Emergency Management from 96 to 2000, where he oversaw the construction of the hardened bunker on the 23rd floor of, the se of Building 7. And on the morning of 9-11, this man was in San Diego, and he, he chipped in on the TV and, and said the same thing what Mr. Barack had said, that 
we know that this is Osama bin Laden, we know who did this. You see, these are people that are putting out the false story right away because they want to get that story out there before the people can start thinking and asking questions. And this is Rahm Emanuel. He would be at a very high level as well. He was considered Mossad's man in the White House during the Clinton administration and the Obama administration. He was Obama's first chief of staff, and he was Bill Clinton's senior advisor at the ripe old age of 15 and a half. No, he, he's a little bit older than that, but he, he looks very young. This young fellow here in the, in the foreground was actually the guy who pushed NAFTA through in 1993. He twisted the arms and extorted the people in Congress to get them to vote for NAFTA. And we all know what NAFTA did to this country. And here is, again, Rami Manuel, David Axelrod. These are the, the one-two punch. These are the guys that, that controlled Barack Obama, made Barack Obama the president, and then controlled him while he, was in the, while he was in the White House during his first term. During the second term, they've moved on to other things. David Axelrod is still pretty close. Rami Manuel is now mayor of Chicago. Rahm Emanuel's father, by the way, is an Israeli terrorist, and he was in that gang of guys called the Stern Gang that killed Volker Bernadotte. So he's the son of a terrorist. Um, this is the rabbi Dov Zakheim, who was the comptroller at the Pentagon when the $2.1 trillion was discovered to be missing. And here he's seemingly saying, well, we're looking for it. Give us some time. You know, we'll find it. This man, Lou Eisenberg, was the commissioner of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which is, the, which is the true owner and parent organization of New York's harbors, ports, airports, subways, bridges, tunnels, and World Trade Center. And so um, this man, in, 19, in, in two, the year 2001, in July, oversaw the privatization so that the towers went from being the property of the Port Authority, they leased them out to a man named Larry Silverstein. And that occurred on, I think, the 26th of July, 2001, a mere five weeks or so before the towers were collapsed, before they were destroyed. And all of these people that I'm showing you are um, basically Jewish by ethnicity and Zionist by ideology. This man here is, is Ronald Lauder. He was the person who oversaw the privatization for the, for the state of New York, in, by which the towers were then dedicated to be transferred to private hands. And he is uh, very close to the Mossad. The Mossad University in Israel, called the Interdisciplinary Center, has a Ronald Lauder School of Government. And here are the, some of the characters involved in that privatization. Here's Ronald Lauder, David Rockefeller, Michael Bloomberg, who served 12 years as mayor after the, after the atrocity. And in the background is Governor Pataki, who um, is more or less the useful idiot in this picture. Now, you know, David Icke will talk about lizard people, and, and I say that Larry Silverstein is a good, an, indica, a good specimen, if there is such a thing, of a lizard person. Um, he certainly looks pretty cold-blooded. He was the, he was a, formerly, he was a strip club owner in New York. He had a club called Runway 69 by LaGuardia, and he, uh, he obtained the lease for the World Trade Center, as I said, on July 26th, 2001. He didn't have the money to buy it or to put it down to lease, so he borrowed money from GMAC, which was already in the hands of Zionist people who were, who were plundering that, that, that company. So the GMAC, under the hands of the American boys, gave him the $100 million that he used for the down payment. And as soon as he became the, as soon as he became the, the holder of the lease, he jacked the rents, up, the, the rents of the tower up 40%. Why did he do that? Because when the towers were then destroyed, he had, he had guaranteed, he had insured future rent profits. So he, first he raised the rents 40%, and that was what was insured. So he increased, his, he increased his, his return by 40% on the rents with one fell swoop. Quite a character. Oh, another thing is that he was a confidant of Bibi Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel. And every Sunday for years prior to 9-11, every Sunday afternoon, these two men would speak on the phone regardless of where they were in the world. Now, what were they talking about? Football? I doubt it. Here is his partner, is Frank Lowy, a former Israeli commando, born in Czechoslovakia, I believe. And he went to Australia and created a company called Westfield, and he owns scores of shopping malls across the United States. And he was the, he was the, lease, he was the guy who had the lease on the retail space at the World Trade Center. 
When 9-11 happened, who were the guys in the white hats? Who were the guys that were on our side, supposedly? Justice, truth. Well, we had Department of Justice head Mr. Ashcroft there and his assistant, Michael Sheratov. Now, Sheratov is an Israeli citizen, an Israeli national, because his mother was a Mossad agent. And he was the person who was the assistant attorney general in charge of the criminal division at the Department of Justice, which means it was his, it fell into his lap, it was his job to investigate the crime of 9-11 and prosecute the guilty people. Well, his agency, the sub-agency that's supposed to do the investigating is called the FBI. That's part of the Department of Justice. And so they were supposed to collect the evidence, analyze the evidence, and provide him with the information that he needs to prosecute the crimes. Well, none of that happened. None of that happened because he decided that they, he would turn over all the crime scene to the city of New York, who would then destroy it. And he kept tight control of the evidence even after he became Homeland Security czar in 2005, because due to a, a, a little stipulation in the, in the Patriot Act called SSI, Sensitive Security Information, um, he was still in charge of who gets to see the evidence. And of course, nobody got to see the evidence, because the evidence was being destroyed for nine years. Now, who gave us the official myth? Who gave us the myth? That was the executive director of the 9-11 Commission Report. This Jewish fella from Southern California, really, um, but he, he finished his degrees in Texas. And when he got his master's degree, his master's degree was how to, basically on creating and maintaining the public myth. And that is that they would, how to create a myth that you can impose on the public to explain something of their history. A myth, a false a falsehood. That's his specialty. And in 1998, he wrote this, this little paper for the Foreign Affairs. This is, this is called Catastrophic Terrorism, Tackling the New Danger. And you can see he wrote it with Ashton B. Carter, who is our new Secretary of Defense, John Deutsch, former head of the CIA, and Philip Zelikow. And you can see what these guys were thinking about. They were imagining the transforming event in December 1998. And this article, this, this article is, is meant to be read by the intelligentsia, you know, leading universities and in the halls of power in Washington, D.C. And it was basically a blueprint about how the government, what actions and what measures the government should take in the event of catastrophic terrorism, which they say here at the bottom um, could happen next month. Well, it happened two years later. Now, who are, who are Ashton B. Carter, the new Secretary of Defense, and John Deutsch? They are here seen as directors of a company called Global Technology Partners, LLC. Yeah. And this group, here you see Ashton Carter up here, and this is John Deutsch there. This is a little think tank and agency that is owned, wholly owned, by a company called North, Rothschild North America. So that means that in their working days before becoming Secretary of Defense, he was a director for a, uh, an agency of the Rothschild family of Britain. So now we have him as Secretary of Defense. And you should know that he is very gung-ho about fighting Iran and waging war. He was confirmed last Tuesday, before Ash Wednesday. And on Thursday, he was in Afghanistan already. So you can see that he considers Afghanistan to be of great importance. Well, you know, of course, Afghanistan is where they're producing all the, uh, all the heroin for the world. So it's probably very important for their game plan. Here's Kenneth Feinberg. He was the special master of the 9-11 Compensation Fund. He is the guy that doled out taxpayer money to the victims' families on 9-11, after 9-11. There were, however, 96 families who did not take the fund, who wanted instead to have a trial. And those 96 families then fought basically what I call a war of attrition with the judge. And as they were settled out of court, all 96 families, none of them got their case ever heard. Rather, every single case was settled out of court. And this is the woman, Sheila Birnbaum, who was taking care of those 96 families one by one. And the result is that each family was given a cash settlement, but they signed the bottom line, that, which said that they will never divulge any of the terms of that settlement or any of the conditions of that settlement and they will never litigate anything on behalf of their, the, the, their, their lost loved one. And here's the judge who oversaw the whole damn thing. His name is Alvin K. Hellerstein. He was appointed to the federal bench in New York by Bill Clinton in 1998. All of the 9-11 litigation has gone through his courtroom. And what's the problem here, what I tried to make very clear to the people in New York for a long time, 
is that his son lives in Israel, where he's a lawyer, living on a settlement in the West Bank. And his son's company represents ICTS, who was the is Israeli company which was the key defendant in the 9-11 tort litigation. Because ICTS is an Israeli company based in Holland called International Consultants on Targeted Security. And they owned the passenger screening company that was at Logan Airport that day. So they were in the docket, to, they would have to explain, if, if everyone went to court, how those guys got on the plane. They would have to prove that those guys didn't get on the plane, if there were any question about that. And how they let these people on the plane with box cutters and knives and strange profiles. You know. But this judge, towards the end of the process, just summar summarily excused them from the case. He said, ICTS, I don't know why you're here. You're just a parent company. You can go home. You see? But the problem is his son was representing that company in Israel. This is called a conflict of interest. When a primary family member is representing somebody in the court, in the litigation, that is verboten. You can't do that. But they got away with it, and nobody in New York seemed to care. Here I'm just presenting some of the various players. That, all of these guys are Zionist agents or Israeli agents. And these are all, these are just some of the key, key areas here. The designers of the terror, the weapons fabricators, the installers, the decoy control, access to the buildings, everything, the whole spiel. And to understand this in, in better detail, you really have to read Solving 9-11, The Deception That Changed the World. Now, why is this, why am I talking about this? Why have I come to America? Why am I taking the time to, to, to try to enlighten my, my fellow Americans about the situation? Because the war on terrorism is a, is a complete deception. It's a fraud. But it's a fraud that has a very high cost for us. It, it means that we've sent men and women overseas to basically harass civilian populations in Middle Eastern countries, in countries where they don't speak the language, don't understand the culture, and all they can do is basically apply force or be killed. And this is, this is dangerous because now we are entering a, new, entering a new phase in this war on terrorism. This ISIS group, ISIL group, what they call in Syria and Iraq, Islamic State in Levant, or Islamic State now, is a big deception. This is another level, level of deception. These characters are basically um, putting on a show and they produce these videos, very much like you saw in the movie Wag the Dog. And these videos are then distributed to the media by this organization called SITE, SITE Intelligence Group. What is SITE Intelligence Group? It's an Israeli website based in McLean, Virginia, headed by a Mossad agent named Rita Katz. So these are basically actors who are putting on this, this uh, event and then it's being filmed, perhaps with green screen or blue screen technology, I don't know. But, but then these, all of these are being then, these videos are then being presented to CNN and BBC by sight. Again, you see the logo up there in the corner. Who is sight? This is Rita Katz. It's this one Israeli lady named Rita Katz. Here, this is from a video from CNN. It says, the woman who found the ISIS execution video. Video, ISIS claims second American beheaded. And when she, made, when she was speaking on CNN, when this video came out, this is what she said. She said, the location from where the video was obtained it, from is the location where ISIS usually uploads their videos, original videos. The video shows a clear message from ISIS that follows the same message that it had before. And in fact, within a short time after our release, ISIS account on social media indicated that within a short time, they would be releasing the video. Only we actually had that video beforehand and we're able to beat them with the release. Now, how did this little Israeli website have the video beforehand, before the actual perpetrators had brought it forward? She had a copy. This indicates that they have the same authorship. And of course, who's being, we're the ones who are being deceived because we're the ones who are, are supporting this the war on terrorism. And of course, this war on terrorism brought our defense budget from $300 billion a year in um, 2001 to 600 billion, where it remained for about 10 years, and now it has gotten closer to three, an, a third time jump, where it's almost 900 billion dollars per year. And it leads to grisly scenes like this, where Americans are, are killed, and of course the, the, the end result is that families are destroyed and broken, um, and, and of course we all know that when, a, when somebody is killed in, in a war, it affects a family for generation.
for generations, as we can see here. So what I'm saying is that if we want to, if we want to um, relieve ourselves of this deception that is destroying our nation and killing our people, we need to understand how we've been deceived and who's behind it because the deception is going on and on and on. And this same kind of false flag terrorism that 9-11 was is now being practiced week after week after week after week. That's the way they're doing it. So that's why I offer you these books and, and my time. So thank you very much for coming.